Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. We've done a lot of episodes regarding employees, and, and most of them are normally directed towards how do you find, how do you hire employees, um, how do you get them onboarded quickly, and how do you get them trained? Well, for this week's episode, we're taking a little bit of a different direction. And specifically, you know, what do you do when things just aren't working out or your employees given notice? In other words, we want to talk about the firing process a little bit. Because, you know, while it's extremely important, obviously, to fill a position, hire somebody when they're needed and whatnot, not letting somebody go or messing that process up somehow can have just as severe of an impact on the practice as messing up the hiring process. You know, when someone's going to leave, you also don't want to mess up that process either because that can be extremely damaging to the practice. And that would include not just, you know, how you've let them go or how they leave, but how long they stick around after they've decided they're leaving or how long you let them stick around if you if they've turned out to be an actual problem. So that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode, you know, wh- what to do when it isn't working out. My name is Jeff Bloomberg and I'm your host. And I'm going to start this episode off with a disclaimer. I am not an employment attorney. And this uh, podcast or any of the information herein does not constitute legal advice. And I do recommend that you have an employment attorney that you can rely upon because you know employment law, while not as, as crazy complex as you might think it is, does vary depending upon where you practice. You know, I know this, and again, I don't know all the laws regarding it, but you know, the, the employment law in California, where we have an office, versus here in Florida, where we have an office, is widely divergent. So you want to be at least aware of these things or have someone you can call to talk to about these things. Now, what I'm going to cover uh, in this week's episode is more, you know, what, what happens. Someone's given their notice or you're letting them go. And I also have a little checklist you can download on this. And these are sort of ideas. Now, you can take some of these ideas and you can bring them to your employment attorney and make sure that it is, is you know, customized to your office so it fits what you're doing in your practice. All right, so I've gotten the uh, disclaimer out of the way. Let's let's get into this. So generally speaking, when you're having trouble with something in an office, it usually is due to lack of a procedure. If you take a look at things that go very smoothly in your office, if I call your office and I want to have uh, – I'm a patient of record, for example, and I'm calling to get a crown done that you diagnosed before. There's not a lot of confusion as to how this is going to go. You're going to get me on the schedule. Well, hopefully not. You're going to get me on the schedule. Uh, you know, The tray is going to be set up the way that you want it. You've already picked the lab you're using. The assistant knows what to do. The lab case is tracked. You know, and usually when these things go wrong, it's a big deal because you know you have a procedure for it. So when you don't have a procedure for things, is when things become confusing. You can apply this to anything. If you're not, uh, if you're having trouble with case acceptance, half the problem is not just whether you can close or not; it's the procedure. You know, and uh, same thing with hiring. Same thing with management meetings, etc. There's no procedure. So I'm going to go over a couple of ideas with you just on this whole concept of you know what do you do if someone's not working out or they're given notice, etc. And we'll, we'll run through this thing. So. Let's first take a look at you have an employee and it's just not working out. They're your scheduler and you have big, huge openings in the schedule. And you know you had a scheduler before who had no problem filling these openings and this new scheduler just isn't doing it, isn't cutting it. And you've done – you know, and how long you're going to spend correcting this person or trying to fix the problem is really up to you um, and you know how – problematic it is for the office, but you've done whatever you've, you're going to do to correct them. You know, I've, I've covered this in other episodes before, you know, what you do to correct an employee or some ideas for that at least. But you've done correction, you've done, uh, you know, you've practiced with them a bit, you've done various things, and it's just not an improving scene. No matter what you do, it's not an improving scene. So you've decided, you know, it's time to end off with this person. Or maybe they've done something really egregious, right? Maybe they, they haven't had a lot long track of mess ups, but they've just done something horribly egregious and you go, I, I got to get rid of this person. They called a patient a four-letter word or something horrible like this. All right, so you've made the decision. They have to go. So now – what would you do in that case? You, you've got this receptionist. They're muffing new patient calls continually. They're just not doing a good job. Uh, you know, they, they don't get along with the other staff. You've made the decision. It's over. So now what do you do? Do you wait till you find another receptionist? Um, I would say no because there, there's a, a way to look at this. It's, it's almost – and I think I've used this example before. I want you to imagine that your team – is like a team in a tug of war. You know, let's say you have five staff. It's you and five staff. So six people on one side and six people on the other side, and you're all pulling the rope. 
So people are going to pull the rope, you know, to whatever degree they're capable of pulling the rope, right? You know, they're, they're, they're tugging against the other team. So, you know, some people are stronger than others. Some people have higher capabilities than others, but you would expect them to at least put some exertion into pulling in your direction so that you can win the tug of war. Well, if you have somebody who is actually messing things up, I want you to imagine instead of pulling in your direction in order to win the tug of war, they're either A, not pulling at all, or they're pushing. They're actually more of a problem than if no one was there. There's a whole why behind this, which we get into on the MGE program. I'm not going to get into it here. But essentially, you've got a situation where literally, and I've seen this so many times in my career, where if they were to be gone, there would be less to deal with. Like with nobody there, there would be less to deal with than with that person there. I mean, if you want to take an extreme example, imagine you had a receptionist who kept hanging up on every third phone call, just accidentally. Didn't know how to work the phone system after five or six weeks on the job, and they kept hanging up after every, you know, every third phone call. Well, if you just put somebody there, maybe it was somebody who was doing something else at the same time, and they didn't hang up every third phone call, it would actually be less destructive to the practice than having that other person that you're paying to be there to hang up every third phone call. It's literally addition by subtraction. And I've seen so many cases where that person is let go or they leave the practice and the practice statistics go up because that person was actually holding the place down to one degree or another. So if you've made the decision, this is not working out and this person has to go, well then, you know, our policy here at MGE, if someone needs to go, they're gone immediately. Now, there are things to consider in certain regards, again, because I don't know where you're listening to this. I mean, we have listeners all over the world, you know, in the EU, the UK, Australia, parts of Asia, uh, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I don't know what your employment laws are, but in certain cases, and here even in the States or in, in Canada, you might have somebody who's a contracted employee. This, what, what I'm talking about here wouldn't necessarily apply, let's say, with an associate. You decided your associate has to go, but there may be certain contractual obligations you have to meet before they can go. Or it may be a contracted employee, in which case you have to make sure that you know, you're doing everything that you're supposed to do according to the contract. Now, a lot of employees, it's an at-will agreement, especially in the state of Florida where I'm located. So there is no contract. So if I've decided someone needs to go, um, they're going to be gone because it's just it's, – it's no longer worthwhile to have them working in the business and they've proven to be at least somewhat destructive. In, in those cases, I'm actually going to be better off with nobody there because you, you kind of can get the idea when you have someone there, even if they're doing a poor job, that something's being done, you know, with by your receptionist or your financial coordinator. But you're already seeing the things that they're messing up. That's just what you see. If you're seeing things they're messing up, I guarantee you there's a lot of things that you are not seeing that they are messing up. So what you might think is getting done actually isn't. So you're better off having nobody there until you fill that position. I would not wait until I hired somebody else, especially if the person is destructive or a problem. I'm just asking for it, and it actually just sends a bad message to the rest of the team. But what if somebody comes to you and gives you two weeks or you know three weeks, four weeks notice? Well, again, let's talk about this because you know in certain cases, um, you know, again, I don't know where you practice, so maybe that's a, a thing here in Florida, to, you know, or in a lot of states, actually, a lot of at will states. Again, not an employment attorney. Two weeks notice is more of a courtesy. You don't have to accept the notice. Now, in certain cases, I will, and in many cases, I won't. So let me kind of give you the differentiating factors here. Let's say I've had an employee who's worked for us for, I don't know, a few years, five, six years, maybe longer, maybe shorter, but they've done a very good job and their spouse is moving out of state. So they're going to move with their spouse. So they give me two weeks notice or um, they had a family situation where they're going to have to go take care of a parent and move out of state and they give me two weeks notice. Would I accept that notice? Uh, Most likely, yes. Obviously, you know, every situation is different. But would I accept that notice? Probably. I would keep them on for the two weeks because it's not like they're leaving because they were a problem here or they've decided to go do something else. They're being le- they're leaving due to circumstances sort of beyond their control or they're they're you know moving with a spouse, etc. So the person hasn't necessarily checked out mentally. But what if I had somebody? Let's say I don't know. Um, well, let's take an example for you. You have a hygienist. And they, or let's use a dental assistant. You have a dental assistant and, um, you know, they saw a practice across town that was advertising and they accepted the position there just because they thought it would be cooler and they give you their two weeks notice. Would I accept the two weeks notice? 
Me? No. If they said they were leaving to go work for, you know, ABC Dental across town, what they've basically told me is that's what they're now into doing and creating. They're, they're no longer, their head is no longer in the game at my practice. They're into creating this, you know, doing whatever they're going to do with this new practice. So I would rather move them out of my practice as quickly as humanly possible, preferably within 24 hours if that were possible. Now, you might think that's a controversial way of doing it. You might, I, you might have different viewpoints on this. I'm just giving you, you know, how I've practiced, practiced this in the sense of if someone gives me notice just because they don't like working for us anymore, have decided to go do something else, why would I keep them around for two weeks? Because they've checked out. Cause it, again, and look, I don't, I don't run people with threats or, you know, uh, you better do this or else. That is just not my thing or my style, but. A person has to know that there are certain boundaries. You know, beyond the fact that a person loves their job and they're professional and they have some pride, why is it a person follows the rules or shows up on time? There is a consequence of not following the rules. If I don't follow the rules enough, I'm going to be gone. Well, if I'm already gone, what do I care about following the rules for the next two weeks? You see, I am checked out. My head is out of the game. So why do I want somebody like that around? And it's nothing personal. I'm not pissed off. I'm not, you know, uh, I don't feel bad towards this person. They're just not a good fit for my organization anymore. Why would I want to keep them around so they can tell the rest of the employees about this new place they want to go work? Or what? It just, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. They're leaving and they're not leaving because they have to move out of state or whatever or they're going to start staying home with the kids. Or They're leaving because they just don't want to be here anymore. So if they don't want to be here – they should just go. Like that should be, you know, one of the basic requirements for an employee should be they actually want to be there. Okay. So in those cases, I would move them out within 24 hours. Do I have a replacement? No, but I'm going to just have to get it covered. If it's a dental assistant, I'm going to bring in a temp. If it's the receptionist, you know, the people at the front are going to have to help cover till we hire somebody else. Now, and most of the time, the team will kind of rally and figure out a way to make it work. And I've seen a lot of cases like this where things actually improve because this person had checked out anyway, so they weren't really working all that hard on their job. I mean, I'm not saying this is always the case, but they were looking, they wanted out, so they weren't necessarily going, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going for it with the gusto here to really make things work in this office. They were looking to get out. So you didn't have 100% of their engagement anyway. So I would move them off. Now, that is my opinion. That's my uh, own personal thoughts on that. That's how we practice it here at MGE. Again, it depends on where you practice. This may be something you want to talk to an employment attorney about, but this is that's just our viewpoint. If it's the person's longer term and they're leaving for a reason that doesn't mean they didn't necessarily want to leave, but it's just the way things worked out, I'll probably keep them around. If the person wanted to leave, I just get them out. There's no reason to have them here anymore. Now, one other point I'll bring up, and this is just a mistake, as we get into the whole process of someone leaving. And again, this is stuff you're going to want to talk to an employment attorney about. One other point I'll bring up that's a mistake is when you're letting somebody go, you want to make sure you always have a witness, okay? Now, again, this is not legal advice. I'm just telling you just things that I've observed. So let's say uh, you know the office manager wants to let the receptionist go. wouldn't be a bad idea to have the doctor there at the same time, okay, or some other senior executive staff member with them. Here's why. If you let somebody go and no one is there with you, well, then it becomes, you know, a he said, she said, or she said, she said, or whatever. Okay. I actually saw this happen to somebody once where they let somebody go and it turned out that the person they had let go was pregnant. The person who let them go did not know they were pregnant and that had nothing to do with why they were let go. They had other employees who were pregnant and stuck around, you know, had the baby, went home, came back to work or whatever. But the person was pregnant, and then they later claimed that the reason they were let go was because they were pregnant. Now, had there been someone else in the room, you at least would have had somebody to refute that claim. So again, this is something I would check with your employment attorney. If you're going to let somebody go, have somebody there with you. Which this brings us to the process of, let's say the person's leaving, whether they've given notice and you've accepted it, or they've given notice and you haven't accepted it, you're going to move on their way, or you've decided it's not working. The next point this process tends to get messed up is things tend to be forgotten or they are mishandled in such a way that it creates backlash later. I mean, it could be something as bad as the person has your social media account passwords and you didn't get them. I actually saw this happen to somebody, a new client, where the employee they ended up letting go had all the social media passwords and the doctor didn't, which I would never recommend. No matter who you have, the doctor has to have administrative privilege to anything you sign up for. And I know sometimes that's tough because – 
you know, the office manager might be signing up for this stuff, but what if the office manager goes? You know, or you might have a PR, you know, director or somebody doing these things. The doctor always has to have administrative privileges. I saw this happen with a Facebook page where the doc lost their Facebook page and it took forever to get it back. I've seen it worse with like QuickBooks where the, you know, the the employee started the QuickBooks account, started embezzling, and the doctor couldn't get their hands on it afterwards. It took like days to get into it to fix it, right? Uh, so you want to make sure that you are covered on these things. The doctor always has administrative privileges to everything, which I'll, I'll go over here in a second, but it can get bad or it can be just kind of annoying. You know, you have a lead assistant and they've left and you have, you don't have a checklist to kind of capture all the steps that should happen and nobody can find anything for four or five weeks or it takes forever to find something because no one knows where it goes. This is why, uh, you know, again, I mentioned if things aren't figured out or you don't have a procedure for something that becomes difficult, it's a good idea to have a checklist, which I have for you. I have a sample and it's set up in such a way for you to customize it. It has all the uh, disclaimer language at the top, but we call it a leaving staff checklist sample, okay? And I'm just going to go over a couple points for it. You can download it on the episode webpage, but if someone's leaving the office, this is something that you would pull out. Let's say it's, it's, you've, you've had the meeting, you've either let them go or they are resigning or whatever. That's when you pull out this checklist and you just run them through all the steps and you're going to want to add steps for your office to make sure nothing is forgotten. You do the same thing with your hiring. You should have an onboarding checklist. I'll probably have one for you guys over the next few weeks when I do an episode. But, you know, we also had uh, sample checklists when you put people on different jobs like scheduler or financial coordinator, whatever that we had as a download a few weeks back. I'll put that up again if you want to see it and download it. But checklists help because, you know, there's lots of little steps involved in all this and you may be forgetting some of these steps. So, you know, pilots use a checklist before they they take off, obviously, because if you forget something, that gets kind of dangerous. So I definitely recommend having something like this that works for your office. You customize it for your office. You can use this as an example to start with, run it by your employment attorney, and then you have something that works for you. So I'm just going to go through it with you. It's actually a couple of the points, at least. I'm not going to read every word. It's like 16 steps, but it walks you through the whole process once the employee is leaving to make sure you don't forget anything. And there's a couple points on here I just want to bring to your attention. So, okay, so the, the first thing that you'd indicate on this checklist, you know, you pull it out, is whether the person has quit or they are um, being let go. Now, there's a reason for this. In certain cases with relation to unemployment, if a person quits, again, don't take this as legal advice. If they quit, uh, you don't pay unemployment versus if you let them go, you do. So you would indicate which one it is. And then the next step asks you, you know, if they're voluntarily leaving, you know, I'm leaving your practice. Can you give me a resignation letter? So, you know, I've told you, doctor, yeah, I'm going to be going to work for ABC Dental across town. You'd ask me to just put something in writing. Can you give me put something in writing? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'll give you two weeks or I'll give you a week. I am leaving to go work elsewhere. Okay, so I've resigned. So most likely if I file an unemployment claim later, I will probably get it denied because I quit and I was not fired. Again, I can't guarantee anything, but that's an example of that. Next thing it has you do is go over what's going to happen with their final paycheck. You know, if they're on direct deposit, when are they going to get it? If uh, you, you mail checks, or you hand them checks, uh, you give them their check. You know, in certain cases, uh, in certain states, for example, if you let somebody go or they quit, you got to hand them their check before they walk out the door. That's a whole different thing, right? So this is why you want to make sure that you're, you, whatever you're doing is applicable to your state. But that is detailed so they at least know what's going on. Maybe you worked out as a part of, you know, whatever they're doing that you're going to pay them X amount. You know, I've seen it where sometimes, you know, someone gives notice or you're letting somebody go and you're giving them a week or two of pay depending on the circumstances. Again, however you're doing, but that's all been worked out ahead of time and you've made sure that they understand that before they leave. Next step, this is point four, is you'd have the person do a turnover. Now, how they do that turnover really depends a lot on, you know, who is this person and why are they leaving? If this is somebody that I've accepted two weeks notice for, you know, they're moving out of state. Well, that turnover would be a write-up. They might update their manual for me. They're going to help me um, uh, gen in the new employee who's going to be taking over their functions so I lose as little experience as possible. I'm going to lose something, especially if this is a well-established employee, but they're going to really turn over this job so that the person they're turning it over to has had a chance to iron out some of the difficulties they might be having and answer their questions. This is somebody I'm, I'm keeping around for two weeks. Let's say it's somebody that they gave me two weeks notice and I'm like, no, they just need to go. Well, how am I going to do a turnover? Well, let's say it's my financial coordinator. I might have them do a brief write-up of anything they're in the middle of. 
you know, they were in the middle of these uh, three claims where they're having to answer a bunch of questions, right? Or, uh, you know, they're the receptionist and they promised that, or sorry, rather the financial coordinator and they promised three patients they were going to get back to them with accounting questions or something. This, I'd have them write all this up for me and I would then get that into the hands of whoever is going to be taking over their job while they're gone. It might be somebody who already has another job and they're just picking up their functions as well, but I want to make sure we don't have any drop balls that create any problem or upsets with patients. They're going to give me something. Okay. So assuming I've had them write up a turnover for me, you know, a little bit of a write up as to what was going on, very simple and concise. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check and see if there are any passwords they have that I don't have. So again, you really should never have this situation, but sometimes you do. Maybe they, and especially, not to get into too much of an explanation of this, if you're familiar with especially software that you're using like Facebook or uh, you know, th- cloud-based, something that's on the internet as opposed to something you've downloaded or you know loaded onto your actual company hard drives. In some cases, I've seen it where employees have administrative privileges, meaning they have the ability to let on new users and cancel users. If this employee who's leaving has administrative privileges, I'm going to make sure that these things are removed and turned over to somebody else. Now, If you do this right, you should never have this issue. As the doctor, you want to make sure, even if you have, it doesn't matter who else you have in the practice, you must be an administrator for every piece of software that you buy, okay? Otherwise, you are always potentially at risk of this happening to you where you're being locked out of something that is actually owned by your business. Now, can you eventually get access back? Yes, but why do you want to have to go through that? So if this person's an administrator or there's any software they're using, they're using that they're the only ones with the password to, I'm going to get all that data now before – this is, you know, they've, they've told me they're leaving or I'm letting them go. This is before they've walked out my door. So I go over, do you have any passwords? Okay, good. I get all that data turned over so that I make sure that they are not going to be keeping passwords or I have access to everything that they had access to. Okay, once I've done that, uh, what would I do? I'm going to see if there's any equipment that they have or a company property that they have that I need to get. Keys, company manuals, uh, maybe uniforms, anything that you would be taking back. I don't know. It really depends on your office. They may have things that belong to the practice, you know, a printer they took home once. You want to make sure you get all this stuff back. They need to turn it back over, especially keys, obviously. Then something else afterwards, what are we going to get into? Now, this checklist I've given you, this isn't like a hard sequence. This is just a sample. But on our checklist here, what comes next is health insurance. So what am I going to do with health insurance? I'm going to let them know. Uh, it depends on how your health insurance works. You may not have any. You may or may not pay premium the premium for the health insurance. You may be being paid part of the premium. But on our little sample here, what do we have? We tell them that their last premium will um, – contribution will come out of their last paycheck. We'll tell them that they'll be getting a letter, a letter in the mail regarding COBRA for the health insurance. And if they're enrolled in any other insurances for the practice, you know, life, disability, we're telling them by, you know, we're going to be letting these companies know they long, no longer work for the company. So they have X amount of days to take those policies over if they want to. Now, in our little sample checklist here, we actually have the employees cited at that point, just so that if they lose their life insurance, they can't say, oh, you never told me that. It was going to get canceled when I quit. They sign it. So they absolutely know. They sign it agreeing that they understood it, that it was going to happen. All right. So now we've gotten most of this stuff turned over from the employee. What are we going to do next? Whoever's doing this, because most likely who's doing this checklist? It's going to be the office manager. It might be the HR director in a larger practice, but it should be somebody who has authority over personnel. So let's say it's the office manager. At that point, the office manager might want to tell him, look, if you have anything relating to the practice or questions about when you were employed here, uh, you know, or anything relating to leaving the office, I should be your point of contact. You don't want them calling a bunch of the other staff to ask questions that should be being directed to you. Now, are they going to call the other staff and talk to them? They might. You can't really do anything about it. That is just the way it is, and it's fine, right? But, uh, and that's why, you know, I've said this before, when someone loses a job, especially if you're dismissing the person, when someone loses a job, it's very degrading to them. So generally, if I'm letting somebody go, I'm going to keep it fairly upbeat, not like happy, but I'm going to be very polite and professional about it. I'm not going to go, oh, you stink. And Because why? It's already degrading enough that they're being let go. It's, it's, you know, it's rejection, whatever you want to call it. So why would I make it worse? You know, because then I'm just going to create an enemy where I didn't have one before. What? Why do that? It doesn't serve me at all. I don't win anything. I'm not living in the Twitterverse, okay? 
So I'm just going to let them go. I'm going to be very nice and I'm going to be polite about it. And I'm just going to let them know, look, if there's anything regarding uh, employment or you know, your last paycheck, this, that, the other, any of those kind of questions, they should just be directed to me so that you know, it's not all over the organization because I'm the one who knows all those answers anyway. Usually a person's fine with that. Again, it's not going to stop them from calling you know, your other employees at that point as long as they're not being a nuisance or distraction during work time. Uh, but again, if you're handling this from a classy perspective, then they really don't have a lot to, to bite onto if they want to give you a hard time afterwards. All right? Okay, so let them know I'm the point of contact. I make sure that they have no other questions for me, right? They may have questions for me. What about my sick pay? What about this? What about that? In which case, hopefully that's stuff detailed in your policy and I would answer those questions. Assuming all those questions are handled, then I would move on to the next step, which is point 10 here on our checklist, which is their belongings. Now, this assumes that they're leaving the office like now. So then I'm going to go with them to their workstation. I might get them a little box and we're going to collect up all their stuff and I'm going to make sure that they are not taking any of the practices stuff. That's kind of important, right? I'm, they're just taking their stuff. There might be other places in the practice where they keep their stuff, you know, lockers, uh, you know, the staff lounge. Now you might go, why do I have to be here during this? You know, this is a great person, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I could give you that on somebody who – you would keep indefinitely, but they're leaving for circumstances beyond their control or they're moving out of state. But, you know, look, ultimately, ultimately, just because they're a great person doesn't mean they're not going to take something they shouldn't. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying not to be trusting or to be paranoid, but it's just, it's a point of professionalism on your part to make sure that you're protecting the practice if you're doing this process with the employee uh, so that they're only taking what belongs to them. So then let's say they've got their stuff. And again, I'm not going to make this a spectacle in front of everybody. We're going to do this very professionally and low key. They've got their stuff. I'm going to make sure they have a way to get home, right? And uh, assuming they do, I'll walk them out of the office. I'll wish them well and they go off on their way, okay? And again, I'm maintaining a very professional demeanor throughout this. I'm polite. I'm cordial. I don't lose my temper. I'm very nice about it because again, it's already, especially if they will let go, it's already very rough to begin with. Now, once they've gone, so now this employee is gone, you do have some housekeeping to do internally, all right? And this is usually uh, some of the things I see that gets messed up. People forget, people get busy, but this is why we have a checklist. Let's just go over a couple of these points. First thing you would do, so they've gone on their way. We have some security and password points. And again, I know you could add to this. So what are the things I'm going to do? Any passwords they had to any company, software, uh, their email, social media, or whatever, I'm changing them immediately, okay? Or if the account has to be switched over to another employee, I'm changing the, the username and the password immediately, okay? I'm going to take if the employee had an email address, you know, let's say it was John Doe at ABC Dental, John D at ABC Dental, I'm going to forward that email address to whomever is now handling their job function. So let's say, uh, you know, Sally Jones at ABC Dental is now handling it, so I'm going to forward John's email to Sally, Okay. <clears throat> then the next thing I'm going to do is if they had the alarm code for the practice, I am going to change this, okay? And I'm going to let anybody know who needs it. If I am concerned about it, I might rekey the practice, especially if it was a very um, bad uh, split, you know, or something along those lines. I may rekey the practice just as a security point, especially if there's direct access from the street as opposed to in an office building. But I leave that up to you if you think it's appropriate or not. And then I'm going to remove the employee from any group text threads or email groups. And this is just as a point of – because then it gets confusing and annoying. You know, you're, you maybe have an email, a text group where you text everybody, hey, we're starting the meeting at 9 o'clock today and you just happen to leave them in it. Then it becomes, you know, oh, hey, you know, sorry, guys. I'm working elsewhere now. It, it just – it avoids little annoying things happening later. So what happens next? I need to inform the team. Now, this is one of these things because your team does need to know that this employee is gone, all right? Now, this is where if you want to know how do I do this, what can I say, what shouldn't I say, again, like I said, things vary so wildly with employment law. Talk to your employment attorney, tell them what you want to say and have them adjust that you know, somehow, some way if it's inappropriate. Here's the only thing I would say is I would not trash I, – I would never trash somebody because it does not serve anything. And what if, what if I have somebody who is just a really poor, poorly producing employee? They're really bugged the heck out of me. They were just terrible. But they're best friends with my dental assistant who isn't a poorly producing employee. Why do I want to get in front of the group and trash them? 
I, I just wouldn't do it. I might even just talk to staff individually and I would just let them know, you know, hey, listen, John, let's say it was John Doe. John's no longer with the practice. He's gone off to do something else. Um, Sally is going to be handling John's functions. You know, we wish John well. But, you know, that that's me. And again, if you don't know what to say and or you want to be certain about it, like I said, this does not constitute legal advice. But I'm not going to get into trashing the person. Really what the team needs to know is A, they're not here anymore and B, who's handling what they were handling before. That, that's really what they need to know more than anything else. Now, they may ask questions. What happened to John? Why did John leave? And truthfully, it really – I hate to say it's none of their – business, that, that really isn't the nice way of saying it because they are part of the group. You don't want to take that that viewpoint. But really, it's sort of inappropriate for me to just be discussing what's happening with one employee with another employee. So it's just, you know, hey, it's fine. You know, look, we wish John well. You know, John's just no longer here. Uh, uh, and you can keep it at that. I would not get into anything because it's, it's tempting, especially if it was a very bad split. You know, John was terrible and John did this and John did that. You're just creating trouble for yourself in the future. Why bother? Why bother? Again, the most important thing for the team to know is John is no longer there. Who is doing John's job? And, you know, you might have somebody ask an astute question. What, let's say John was the treatment coordinator. What do I do if a patient asks why John isn't here anymore? We just say, yeah, John moved on to something else. We wish him the best. You know, because again, what can happen, and I've seen this happen, with, especially with these bad splits, is the, 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 the good and the bad of social media. This is the bad is the employee who is fired goes off and just goes on a tear on your Google account, your Facebook account, and they're, you know, all over your your employees, you know, talking to them and telling me how horrible you are or whatever. Here's my viewpoint. Obviously, if that becomes a problem, you're going to have to handle that as you deal with it. But I'm going to be completely uh, cool about it. I'm not going to create more problems with this potential employee by trashing them in front of the group and giving them a reason to go do all of this. That's why I'm maintaining a nice viewpoint as I do it all, okay? Plus also it's just more professional. And again, you know, why am I fighting that fight? I don't gain anything from winning that fight. All right, so now we get to the administration uh, or administrative aspects of things. We've informed the team. There are a few other administrative aspects just to, to wrap this thing up. I'm going to remove the former employee's name from any applicable points in the practice if I have an organizational chart, lockers, notice boards, baskets, etc. I'm going to let the payroll service know that the employee's gone. I'm going to let the insurance company or the insurance broker I deal with know the employee's gone and when they left. I've transferred any additional user accounts the employee might have had with any of the other companies the practice deals with. And I've, if I, let's say I have, you know, my team on the employee web or the uh, company website or the practice website and I have a picture of this employee, I'm going to take them down. Okay. Just so that, you know, they're gone. It's over. It's done. And then I'm going to take all this stuff. And this is all in this checklist you can download, by the way. And I'm going to put it in their personnel file and your personnel file should be secured properly. Uh, and I'm just going to file it away. So it's just done. But this way I made sure, and again, there are things you might want to add to a checklist like this, but that's sort of the broad strokes to make sure that I did not miss anything when I let this employee go or the employee left, because missing these things is how you create problems later. I, this is why I love checklists. Checklists are just awesome in this regard. So that about wraps it up for this week. I know it wasn't, uh, you know, the, the happy concept. How do we hire or how do we train or whatever? But it is something that you deal with turnover and you want to make sure that the, when you do turn somebody over, it's as untraumatic as possible. So you can download this checklist from the episode webpage. I'll also put the employee checklist for the different positions up there as well. And by the way, a lot of this comes from our online platform, DDS Success. We have some positional training on there as well as different type of training for your team. If you want to check it out, I'll put a link for that as well. Guys, that's all I have for you this week. I hope this helped. If you have any questions about MGE or need any kind of help, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Have a great week. We'll see you the next episode.